This video is brought to you by Sayerite. Visit Sayerite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. This chaise lounge is in desperate need of being reupholstered. In this tutorial video, we're going to show you how to reupholster this uh, chaise lounge with new decorative fabric that's available from Sayerite. We'll show you every single step. After watching this video, any DIYer with a little bit of gumption should be able to reupholster a chair like this. Cindy's going to show us how it's done. Here's Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Fletcher and I'm the owner of Quilts and Cushions in Cherubusco, Indiana and I'm going to help here at Sailrite today redo this chase chair. Um, it has a pretty solid cushion on the seat in the back and they both will come off. Um, the deck underneath and uh, we're going to start taking it apart today. Thanks Cindy. The first step is removing the old fabric. The chaise lounge has been turned on its side so we can gain access to the underside. Here we're removing the staples that hold the cambric dust cover in place. Here we're removing some of the staples that attach the skirt around the perimeter of the chaise lounge. As you disassemble the fabric panels from the chair, be sure to keep all of the old ones so that we can pattern off them and also keep the hardware. Now the dust cover can be removed. Okay, we're ready to take the skirt off. That's the next piece that'll come off and we're gonna save all the pieces for the skirt also so we can make the new skirt the same as the old one. Flip the skirt up and there's a cardboard tack strip to give it a nice crisp edge. We'll remove the staples from that and then eventually remove the skirt. Don't worry if you damage them. We have more cardboard tack strips that you can purchase from Sailrite. To gain better access, the chair is upside down and it's leaning up against the upholstered work table. If you haven't done upholstery jobs like this, it's not a bad idea to take pictures of the chair before it's disassembled, so you know how to reassemble it in the same manner. Okay, before I take these pieces completely off, I'm going to mark where they go on the chair. This is the back piece. This is a side back piece. Side front piece. And then when I can move the chair, I'll mark the front pieces also. Often the most time-consuming part of reupholstering a chair like this is removing the old staples. This one is the side front and this one is the front. That way when I go to make the new ones I'll have the correct sizes in the correct place. This cording was stapled on first before the skirt so we still have to take this off before we can actually start taking any of the pieces off of the sofa or the chair. When we reassemble the chair, adding the skirt is the last step, and some people prefer not to use a skirt at all. I'm going to measure where the piping is put on on the, this piece so that we know where to put it back on when we put it back together, and it's a six and a quarter inches from the bottom of the frame to the stitching. If you like skirting and plan to add it back on the chair, write that measurement on one of the pieces. If skirting is not applied, this piping would not be stapled in place around the perimeter of the chair. Now Cindy's working on the bottom of the chair, removing the staples so she can pull the fabric off the back of the chair first. Once the staples are removed from the bottom side, the fabric that rolls around to the bottom side, that is, is loose, then we can remove the tack strips that are on the side. We'll just use our staple remover to pry them up. Typically, a tack strip like this is used on the back side of a chair, and at the top, a curved tack strip is typically used. When we reassemble the chair, we'll be showing you how to use these metal tack strips that uh, we just removed. No need to save them. Again, Sayrite has replacements if they are bent up. Now the reason those straight metal tack strips were not used at the corner is because it takes a gradual curve. So here, a flexible metal tack strip was used, and again, Sayrite carries those as well. Here Cindy is using that tool to bend up the prongs uh, so that she can remove the old fabric. Again, remember to keep the old fabric so we can pattern the new fabric from it. Those flexible tack strips really bite down on the fabric, as you can see here. I'm going to mark this outside back. And we're going to save this piece of batting also and put right back on here when we put it back together. 
If your batting is in bad shape after you remove it, again, Cerite carries a very thin batting that will uh, work well for a replacement. But in most situations, if you're careful, even removing staples like this is pretty easy and we can reuse it again. So we're going to save that as well. We'll need to take this piece off also and I'll save this too so we can put it back on when we get ready to put it back together. This is just an underlayment fabric just to support the decorative fabric and the polyester backing on the back of the chair. Anything can be used here. I'm going to push these prongs out of my way so I don't cut myself with them. And then I can take these staples out a little bit easier. It is nearly impossible to use the flexible metal tack strips over again. Once they are removed, they're usually in really bad shape. Don't worry, we have more. Now we're going to remove the cording on this outside back piece. This cording is the last step of the rear panel for our chaise lounge. This outside arm is the next piece to come off, so we'll start tearing it apart and it'll have the batting underneath and the, also the protection underneath like the outside back did. And I'm going to mark it outside arm. And it's the second piece that we have taken off, so I'm going to put a tube on it. Cindy is not including the uh, cambric dust cover that was on the bottom side as a panel. That's why she labeled this one too. This panel also uses a straight metal tack strip at the top here. And then at the top, a cardboard tack strip to give it a crisp, clean edge. This chaise lounge is an Ethan Allen, and the frame is in phenomenal shape, uh, made from very good quality wood, and they used a ton of staples. I guess that's what you get when you pay good money for furniture. We will not show removing the outside arm of the opposite side, though that needs to be done. The next piece to come off is the inside back, so I'm going to work on this um, outside part of it and then I'll flip it over and get the inside stuff. And it's also attached right here. The inside back panel usually consists of fabric poles. Those are attached to the panel and then pulled through the frame and then stapled right to there. it to tension it appropriately. The inside back is also attached right here. This stretcher goes to the inside back. What I call fabric poles, Cindy calls stretchers. It's the exact same thing. And it's also attached in here. Manufacturers of these chairs usually make the stretchers or the fabric poles from scrap fabric or less expensive fabric than the decorative fabric. These fabric poles are typically sewn to the decorative fabric. They will not be seen since most of them are just pulled through uh, the frame and then stapled to the frame on the inside of the chair. Using scrap fabric for fabric poles or less expensive fabric is not required. If you have excess decorative fabric, you can use it for fabric poles or stretchers, or you can use the stretchers on the old fabric or the old fabric itself if it's in good shape. As Cindy removes the backrest panel, she's trying to keep the polyester batting intact as much as possible. There's still something attached down here. There's still a fabric pole that's stapled on the underside, so she flips the chair on the side so she can hopefully find where that fabric pole or stretcher is attached. Currently, we're working on the backrest panel, but don't be alarmed if you remove staples from other stretchers. In other words, stretchers that are used for the deck or stretchers that are used for the inside arms. No big deal. They'll eventually all have to be removed anyway. Cindy is still trying to figure out where this backrest panel is attached. Uh, once she finds it, she'll be able to pull it apart. Ah, so not only did it go to the back of the chair, it also is attached at the sides of the chair. So she'll have to do that same thing on the opposite side. And that will release the fabric from the chair.
Now that the back uh, rest panel is removed, we can inspect it and we can see where the stretchers were sewn onto the decorative fabric. There's the inside back off completely. And I'm gonna put a three on this because it's the third piece that we've taken off. Okay, we're ready to take off the inside arm uh, today, so I'm going to put a four on this because this is the fourth piece we've taken off. We will be reassembling each one of these panels in the exact same order that they were removed. That's why she's labeling them with numbers. The inside arm also utilizes stretchers or fabric poles. Here Cindy is removing the staples to those as well. And the inside arm on the back side of the chair uh, has a stretcher there as well. To gain some visibility here at this corner here, at the back of the armrest, Cindy's going to have to remove a few of the staples so she can pull up the batting and the foam a little bit to uh, remove the staples there. Lift up the foam on the inside and there's still some fabric stapled uh, to the frame there. Whoops, we didn't really want to rip the uh, old fabric, uh, but it's not a serious rip, so we'll still be able to pattern from it. Oh, we found Ooh. a toy necklace. Too bad it wasn't money. The chaise lounge has been flipped over to the underside, and we are working on removing the decking. This is still attached. The deck is right back here on the back and in here on the sides. I take these out and I should be able to take the piece off. This little piece right here, the elastic with the hook on it, will hold the cushion in place. So we'll put a hook on the cushion and then this will get installed back in this area. Around the perimeter of the decking there is a foam edging and on top of that is what looks like to be a cotton batting. Uh, polyester batting would work there as well. Cindy's carefully removing the cotton batting in an effort to try to reuse it again. Then she will remove the staples in the foam edging. We will try to reuse that as well. If you're looking for edging like that it's typically called edge roll. You may be able to find it on an online search. Sarah currently does not stock it. Again, we will save the edge roll in an effort to reuse it again. Underneath the edge roll, or edge foam, there are staples attaching the decking. We will remove those. And thin layers of polyester batting around the side. We're going to save everything here because we might be using those uh, items again. So we're going to try to carefully remove them. When removing staples, sometimes some of the uh, posts break off. You can just hammer those back into the wood. After removing all of the staples and the fabric poles or stretchers, the decking can be removed from the chair. Still have to do it on one more side. Once the decking is removed, we can inspect it and see that uh, it is actually made of several different layers of fabric with a polyester batting uh, in the center. This chair was well built indeed. So that's actually stitched to this piece right we'll here. We'll be taking the decking panels apart so we can use them for patterning. Everything is removed. Now it's time to start rebuilding. We're going to start with the last thing we took off, the decking. This is the deck piece that we just took off, and the first thing I want to do is take this apart. There's a row of stitching here that's holding these three pieces together. So I'm going to take out the stitching and then I can start making my new pieces. We are not cutting the fabric, we are simply cutting the stitches that holds each one of these panels uh, together. You can use a seam ripper, scissors, or nippers to do this. 
This little tuck right here wasn't stitched, so I'm going to put a pin in it to hold it together till I get ready to go back and work on it so I don't forget to put that tuck back in there. This one is, oh, this is a seam, so I don't need to mark that in any way. Here's another tuck that's not actually stitched down. If the tucks or pleats had been sewn, she wouldn't have to pin them. But to remind her that she needs to include those in the panel, when she sews it, she puts a pin in it. Now we have this front part of the deck all taken apart, and there's a tuck right here in the corner. I'm going to take that out too, so this piece will lay flat when I put, make the new one. This stitch line, or what Cindy called a tuck, is a corner. So she'll remove the stitches and it'll basically splay it out. She will re-sew that again when she makes the new fabric. There was one on the left and one on the right. And I can also take this seam apart right here. It's on each side of the front corner. Okay, I'm going to mark these so I can take these pins out and this piece will lay flat to pattern a new one. So I'm going to make a mark here on the uh, back side of it and then a mark right here where the fold is so that when I put it back together I know I want to match this mark to this mark and then the tucks will be the same size. And I will do that with all of them. These are the two side front pieces. So I need a side front and a center and I can, I don't need both of these. I can pattern the two side fronts off of this one. And we'll also need to cut a piece like this one for the deck to attach these other pieces to. So I'm gonna use this for my pattern for that. We only have to replace the decorative pieces. So this piece underneath with the polyester batting, we will reuse, so be sure to save that. To pick your decorative fabric, visit the Sayrite website. You'll find thousands of decor and upholstery fabrics that work great for an upholstery job like this. For this chaise lounge, we've chosen to use a fabric brand called Krypton. So we went to popular fabric brands and clicked on Krypton. You'll see multiple colors and styles. How much fabric do you need? Scroll down to the bottom of our website and click on Fabric Calculator. There you will find many calculators for many projects. Click on upholstery, then click on chairs. This will give you an approximation of how much fabric is required. We're ready to cut our deck for this um, chase chair. And these are the three pieces that I need. They'll be sewn back on, on the side, on the front, and on the side. We're gonna cut up the roll of fabric because we think it looks better that way. We will have some waste along the sides of the pieces. Um, but we like the way the fabric looks going up the chair instead of across the chair. And I'm going to fold these in um, and we'll cut new stretchers for here. We can reuse this one. But here and here we'll need a new stretcher to make it a little bit longer so we have more to pull with. So I'm just going to cut this exactly like it is now. Regarding cutting from our old fabric, how accurate do we need to be? Well, anywhere the fabric was stapled, we actually want the fabric to be a little bit big. But anywhere that it was sewn, we need it to be exact. So here you can see that she's cutting it a little bit large. That's because this edge is stapled. This area right here around the front, I'm giving myself about an extra half an inch just so I have more to pull on when I apply it to the chair and I'll probably have to trim that off after it's applied. Um, pieces that we're going to add on to this are stitched right here where this seam is. So this, this area right here will be underneath when we put it on the chair. Here there's a slit, probably to go around some obstacle. We are not going to cut into that slit. We'll actually do that when we get the fabric onto the chair. This cut that goes in right here, I'm not going to do that right now. I'll do that when I put this piece on the chair and make sure that it fits properly when I'm putting it on. When you see cuts in the fabric panel, as Cindy just explained there, those are usually made so that the fabric can be slipped around an obstacle, usually the wooden frame. You'll see that later on. These three pieces of the decking were sewn in place, so Cindy's going to ensure that they lay flat and she's actually going to pin it to the decorative fabric. 
this decorative fabric has a distinctive weave that uh, runs up the length of the fabric and we think it'll look better if that weave is orientated so that it runs from the front of the chair to the back of the chair. So she's being careful to line up all the fabric so it does that. Here she's pinning down the fabric and making sure the seam allowance is folded out so she can cut these to the exactly the right size. Our chaise lounge has removable cushions and a skirt around the side and we also wanted the fabric weave to go in a certain direction and because of that it takes a lot more fabric than what's typically required. We used a total of 13 yards of 54 inch wide fabric. Again, sides that are sewn need to be accurately cut, sides that are stapled do not. They just need to be at least as big as the old panel or slightly bigger. These are where the little tucks are that make the curves around the front of the chair. So I'm gonna mark these with a clip before I um, take this piece, of the pattern piece off. These small notches or cuts in the fabric will indicate where each one of these tucks are located and they do not go deeper than the seam allowance which will be a half inch for this uh, application. So make sure they don't go deeper than a half inch. These two pieces here are the pieces that get added to each side of the center piece. Um, so I'm gonna use both of them and cut them uh, both out, each with their own pattern piece. You could just cut one and turn it over right sides together to get your two pieces if you like. Right here in this area, I'm going to give myself a little bit more um, fabric because this will pull around the out to the outside of the arm. So I need a little bit more to work with right there. Anywhere that uh, a fabric is going to be stapled, it's always a good idea to go larger rather than smaller. That's what Cindy's doing here, just to make sure she has enough. And this piece also has one tuck in it right here where it connects to the center. So I'm gonna mark that with clips also. And then I'm gonna cut out the other side just like it. As mentioned earlier, we'll be reusing some of the decking pieces, but these are all the decorative pieces that we need. These are the four pieces for the deck that I just cut out. Um, these two will get sewn together along here. These two get sewn together along here, and then it all gets applied to this piece. Our decorative fabric has a weave that's very noticeable. Let's pause here and study this. These arrows indicate the weave of the fabric. You can see the two side panels. We want the weave to actually go up. That's customary, but it is your choice as always. If we were to look ahead at the finished chaise lounge, these arrows indicate the direction that uh, we ran the weave or the pattern of the fabric. Doing it this way is not the rule. You want to do what looks best, but uh, in our opinion, this is the way uh, this weave would look best. So that's what we did. We're ready to put this deck piece together and it gets sewn to this piece of, uh, there's a piece of padding in here and then this uh, support underneath. And I'd like to be able to see where the stitching line is when I um, take it to the machine. So I'm gonna pin it together on this side and then I'm gonna turn it over when I get to the machine to stitch it. And it actually gets sewn from here all the way around over to here. By studying the old piece, which okay. she's actually using on the bottom side, you could usually tell where the sewing stopped. That's what Cindy was referring to there. You can see where the stitching stopped on that. That's also a good reason to take pictures in advance. If you do get confused, you can always go back and look at your pictures before you tear everything apart. So now the decorative fabric is facing the tabletop of our sewing machine and the uh, decking underneath the supportive fabric is face up. Those marks that were put on by the factory are where Cindy is sewing. So this encases that uh, polyester batting uh, that is compressed on the inside of this decking piece. 
To sew this project, we're using the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine with the Workhorse Servo Motor, an excellent sewing machine for upholstery projects like this, and sold at a great price at Sayrite. Now those pins can be removed. We're almost ready to put our chair together, but I have to put these front deck pieces that go around here onto this big piece. And they get a fold sewn here. And there's tucks in these that I marked with clips. By clips, she means cuts. And there's three pieces to this, so I will put these two and stitch them together right here, right sides together. There's a tuck right here as well. And then this one gets added to the other side. And it also has a tuck and this fold at the corner. So I'll stitch all these three pieces together and get the tucks put in and the corners put in and then we'll apply it to this big piece. Now we'll take it to the sewing machine and we'll first sew those corners shut. This is a half inch from the raw edge and when we get to the part where the uh, top is we'll do a little bit of reversing there. Now we'll sew each one of these panels together where Cindy indicated earlier outside surfaces are facing each other. Half inch from the raw edges as the edges are matched up, doing some reversing at the beginning and the end. Same procedure here will not show all of this. And we'll finish up that last corner. Next, we'll concentrate on those pleats. We have slits to indicate where each pleat goes. To make this pleat, Cindy folds upon each one of those slits over top of them and then just sews a straight stitch very close to the raw edge of the fabric. She pushes the seam allowance towards the presser foot here. Not that it matters which way that goes. And then she sews up to the second pleat area. Watch how she does it here, close up. So the slits are directly on top of themselves to create that pleat. And there's one more pleat, I believe. Yep, right there. Slits on top of each other, creating a fold. And then sew them in place so they stay in place. That should do it on this side. We'll do the same thing on the other side. We will not show that. I'd like to mark the center of this front piece and then I'll line it up with the center of this piece and I'll pin it around and we'll stitch again in the same area where I stitched this big piece. Cindy matches up the seams so they're directly across from each other and folds the front half so she knows where the middle is and then creates a slit going no deeper than the seam allowance which is a half inch. So the slit is about a quarter inch. Now she knows where the center is, and you can see the manufacturer put a line at the center position on the decking material underneath, so she knows where the center is of the chair. This piece will eventually be pulled down along the side of the chair, so the outside surface is facing each other as Cindy pins it in place. She pins it in place along the stitch she made when she sewed the decorative fabric to the decking encasing the polyester batting. 
It is pinned in place with a half inch overlap, so when she sews it on, it will be almost directly on the same stitch line. So the stitch line is a half inch away from the edge of the fabric that Cindy is pinning down. She lifts the fabric to check where that stitch line is so that she can position this fabric a half inch past that stitch line. When I'm stitching this, I'm going to start right here where we put this uh, tuck fold in there and stitch all the way around to the other side at the same spot. She goes back to the middle position and starts pinning in the same way that she did the other side. We will not show that. And now she takes it to the sewing machine and sews. Hopefully, if it's done right, this stitch should be right on top of the stitch that secured the decking underneath it. It doesn't have to be exactly on top, but it should be very, very close. No reason to check as long as you pin the fabric a half inch over that stitch line. Just uh, sew a half inch in and you should be fine. She'll sew all around the perimeter, pulling the pins as she comes up to them. This sewing machine could also sew through the pins and then you can pull them later. Uh, but Cindy is used to pulling pins before she gets to them. Here we are sewing around the corner with those tucks or pleats already sewn down so we don't have to worry about creating them. They've already been sewn in place, which we showed in an earlier step. At this corner you can see Cindy left the pins in place and just sewed over them. That's quite acceptable with a heavy duty sewing machine like the Sayrite sewing machines, whether it be an ultra feed or this fabricator. She sews up to that corner or tuck and stops sewing there. And now Cindy will show you what it looks like when she will pull it over the frame of the chair. So this pulls down like that. and those tucks make that corner look great. Now Cindy's using some of the scrap decorative fabric to uh, sew on fabric poles. She'll install them on the left and right side and also at the rear of this decking piece. Let's now lay this on the floor so you can see where we installed those fabric poles. There they are. Let's move on. The decking piece is fabricated. Now let's pattern and sew the inside arm. I'm also going to take the arm, the inside arm apart, but before I take this apart, I'm going to put a couple uh, marks on it where this piece matches this piece so I know how to put it back together and that's just making a, a, a hash on each side. Again, we will remove the stitching holding each one of these panels together. We are not cutting the fabric, only the stitching. For accurate patterning, we're going to also remove the piping. The piping will probably be sewn onto the front of the armrest later on, but we'll show that eventually. The next piece we're going to cut is the inside arm, and here's the two pieces for the arm. This goes on the front, and this goes up and over the roll of the arm. This does have cording in between those two pieces, so we'll need to cut that in a little bit. But I'm going to cut this one first, and I'm going to cut two of these. I'm going to cut one like this, and then I'm going to flip it over and cut the other one. We did not take the other arm apart. So I'm going to start with these two small pieces. The front panels of the armrest are placed on the decorative fabric so the weave is running fore and aft, in other words up and down. The edges that will be stapled will be cut slightly larger. The edges that are sewn will be cut exactly to size, like here at this uh, V. 
that portion above the V is sewn to the assembly, so she cuts directly on the edge of the fabric, so it's exactly the same size. These marks are a reference to where I need to attach it back to the big piece, so I'm going to make a clip where those two marks are. Don't go deeper than your seam allowance for those reference marks or notches. Now we'll use this one we just cut as a way to make the second front armrest panel. We're going to cut it to size. Notice the outside surfaces are facing each other, so it's mirrored. Now we'll pattern using the old fabric for the uh, armrest itself. This is the inside armrest. We will pin it to the decorative fabric in an effort to keep it flat and keep it from moving. This is the sewn edge. Here Cindy will explain more. This edge right here is the edge that gets sewn to the curved piece that I just cut. So I'm going to cut that exactly where it's cut now. Here and over here I'm going to give myself a little bit more so that I have fabric to pull to pull it around the top of the arm. And these two black marks correspond with the clips that I made on the little curved piece, so I'm going to also mark those before I take the piece off. Cindy will move the stretchers or the fabric poles out of the way and cut very close to the edge of the fabric. We will add stretchers or fabric poles later on. Cindy did not cut out that notch. That's probably to get around some of the uh, framing of the chair. So she'll do that when she goes to install it on the chair. No reason to cut those in advance. Then we'll mirror that again and cut out the second one. We will not show all of this. So here's my two arm pieces in my right and my left piece. Um, eventually we'll cut some cording that will go around here and this edge gets sewn and makes this curve right here. Cindy will use her old fabric panel to confirm that the arm is going in the right spot on the new fabric. We're going to sew the arm pieces together. Um, here's where we made our marks to match up to this band. So I have clips, so I'm going to match those two clips together. We'll need stretchers on these two edges. So I'm going to cut that out of our um, fabric because we have so many scraps. And then this piece I'll make a little bit longer here. And I'll sew it around here. And then I'm going to make it all the way down to here also because it has to come down to the bottom of the chair on both sides. In my opinion, Cindy did not leave quite enough at the bottom for the piping. I would actually have the piping extend at least 12 inches just to be safe. Rather safe than sorry is my saying. And here again, instead of using the stretchers off of the old fabric, Cindy's using some of the scrap of the decorative fabric and cutting it to the approximate size of the stretcher and then sewing it onto the arm pieces. Stretchers will not be visible, so don't worry about being very precise here. They're just used to pull the fabric panel around the frame of the chair. We already made some bias piping. In a future chapter, we're going to show you how to make it if you don't know how to make bias piping. Now for the front arm piece, the piping needs to be sewn around the perimeter, leaving a tail of approximately 12 inches at the bottom edge. Here, we're using the quarter inch cording foot for the fabricator sewing machine. We'll want to stop sewing at that notch section, but we definitely don't want to cut the piping at that notch. Watch what Cindy does here. When she reaches the notch, she stops sewing. No need to do reversing here because when we sew this panel to the main panel, we'll do reversing then. Then cut the excess off, leaving about a 12 inch extra at the bottom. She only left about 6 inches, which may eventually be a problem. Hopefully not. Uh, that's why I like to leave 12. Outside surfaces are facing each other, and she's going to sew the uh, front of the arm together, matching up those notches. So she's basically sewing right uh, over top of that notch down the one leg. 
When you reach the bottom of the fabric, sew about an inch past that and then stop sewing. You may want to do a little bit of reversing here. To sew from the opposite direction, she'll flip the panel upside down and she will start sewing uh, a couple inches over top of the stitches where she began sewing. And because this is curved a lot, you can see the fabric wants to warp up. Cutting small notches in it like this will allow the fabric to relax there because of the curve that is designed into the top of the arm. Cindy lifts up the fabric to check where the notch is on the uh, front of the arm and it is matched up with the notch that's on this panel that she's sewing to it. So she continues to sew around the curve slowly here, matching up the edges as she sews. This new cording foot for the Fabricator sewing machine or the Sarite 111 is phenomenal. It works great. It was specially designed by Sarite, exclusively sold by Sarite. When she reaches that notch, she will do some reversing there. This locks everything in place. This is the inside arm of the chair. We have one more panel like this to do, the opposite side. We will not show that since the process is done in exactly the same way. This is what it should look like. Inside arms are done. Now it's time to focus on the inside back. This is the inside back and it has these little stretchers added to the side, so I'm going to remove those also so that I can make a good pattern of this piece. Though what she is removing now is probably a stretcher, you'll notice that some of that stretcher is actually the decorative fabric. That's done because it may be visible when it's pulled through the frame of the chair. That's why they use decorative fabric for a small portion of it and then scrap fabric for the rest. We'll do the same with our new fabric. The next piece that we're going to cut is the inside back. It has a little stretcher sewn to it that goes along here. So I'm going to cut three pieces, two of these and just one of these. I'm ready to cut this piece and I'm going to cut it exactly to size right here where it's been sewn but out here and around this top edge, I'm gonna give myself a, another inch or so of fabric so I have more to pull with. And you can see there's tucks right here and here, but these were put in as the piece was applied to the furniture. These aren't sewn in tucks, so I don't need to mark those. Things like that make it fairly important to sometimes take some snapshots of areas that have pleats so you know how they were done. We mentioned that at the beginning of this video. We actually have plenty of scrap fabric there and we could include the stretcher when cutting out this panel, but uh, Cindy decides to add the stretcher on later on, which is not a big deal. Uh, it does save fabric, but when you have scrap, you can use the scrap as a stretcher or fabric pole. Now I'll need two of these, so I'm gonna turn over this piece and just cut another one. This one doesn't have to be perfect, it's gonna be hidden. This is the inside back and these two pieces will go around here as your stretcher. And these get stretchers added to the outside of them and then we'll put a stretcher on down here also to make it long enough to pull down underneath. We're gonna to stitch together the inside back pieces. These stretchers, there's one of these on each side and then there's a stretcher across the bottom I'm gonna reuse this stretcher right here and apply it to the bottom, but for these side stretchers that I need to add on out here, I'm gonna cut some pieces from our scrap fabric that we had left from cutting the chair. So instead of cutting off the stretchers on the sides, she's only gonna cut off the stretcher at the bottom here and reuse this. The other ones, she's not gonna do that. She's just actually gonna use some of the scrap fabric to make stretchers, as we talked about earlier. Your task is to create something that looked like the old panel that you removed from the frame. And that's all that we're doing here. We're showing this in double time. The fabric that Cindy has just cut, no one will see, but the small strip, the long small strip, they might see. That's why if you look at the original chair, that's decorative fabric while the other portion is gray. 
So here we are sewing the uh, fabric pole or stretcher onto the bottom. This is the old fabric that we removed uh, from the uh, decorative fabric that was old. It is not completely centered. It is not completely cut to size because all it is is a stretcher. So don't worry about it if it doesn't fit perfectly. It doesn't need to. Now Cindy will sew the long rectangular piece, which is the decorative fabric, onto the stretcher part uh, that can be scrap uh, or portion of your decorative fabric if you have extra, which we did. Outside surfaces are facing each other. That small rectangular piece may be visible. The larger one underneath it will not be visible. Now we'll sew the left and right side stretchers onto the inside back panel. If you don't know where these go on the back panel, refer to your old pattern that you should still have. It's done in exactly the same way. The seam allowance is approximately a half inch all around the perimeter. This is the left side. Now we'll do the same thing to the right side. We will not show that since the process is done in exactly the same way. Outside surfaces always face each other. Our inside back panel with the stretchers is now complete and she is uh, checking it to the old piece to make sure she did everything correctly. And she did. Next, we'll pattern the outside arms and the back. No sewing is required for these panels. These two pieces are the outside arm pieces, and I'm going to peel off this batting so we can um, cut them from the new fabric. And I'll need one for the left and one for the right. And these don't have to be cut exact. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room on these also so that I have room up here to attach and room down here to pull. Here's the two outside arm pieces, the left and the right. This is the outside back piece that I'm gonna cut next. And it also can be cut just a little bit bigger all the way around. So this is our outside back piece, all cut. How to make bias piping is next. We already used it on the arms of the chair, but we're gonna use it elsewhere as well. We're gonna use up some of these smaller pieces on the cording, and I wanna cut that on the bias because it has to go around the curve on the front of the arm and a curve on the back of the chair. So to get started, I'm gonna fold this up so that I have a 45 degree angle right here. And if you want to uh, be accurate about that, you can hold your ruler along the edge of this fabric and make sure that this edge lines up with the edge of your ruler. And I'm going to cut along that 45 degree. My cording gets cut in an inch and three quarters to cover the 532nd cording. Okay, when I put this together, I wanna make sure that the nap is continuous up the cording in case there's any shading differences. So I wanna make sure that this end gets attached to this end. So I'm gonna mark all the top of these and then I know that a top goes to a bottom when I get sew it together, like this. We'll need a lot of piping, so we're gonna go ahead and continue to cut strips so that we can join multiple pieces together. So I have one marked edge and one unmarked edge, but in order to put them together, the angle has to be the same. So I'm gonna trim this angle at 45 and then I can turn this over and lay these together like that. And I'm gonna stitch from that angle to this angle when I put them together. So 
so I have a mark and no mark. We'll just keep repeating this until we have the appropriate amount of piping to cover our application. We'll be applying the piping to the cushions, also the armrest, and also around the perimeter of the chair if we uh, choose to add the skirt, and also on the back of the chair. We are joining the fabric together with the cording foot installed, though that does not need to be installed for this. It, it does need to be installed for the cording. Once our bias strips are joined together, it's now time to insert the cording and fold it over it. And now the cording foot must be installed, which we already have installed on this the Serite Fabricator sewing machine. We prefer to have stitch length set at about four millimeters in length when sewing upholstery jobs like this. Here we're coming to the first joint. Cindy splays it out so that it lays nice and flat. This is a brand new cording foot that's available uh, only from Sayorite. It's specially designed for the Sayorite Fabricator sewing machine and it works perfectly as you can see. It's now staple time. We'll start with the decking. We're ready to start stapling this piece on and we have this center mark right here. So I'm gonna line that up with the center of the front of the frame. First this gets stapled down and then this gets laid on top of it. And then this gets pulled around to cover up the front of the chair. So we're going to start by stapling this down. The first step is just to secure the decking with a few staples around the perimeter. So towards the front and towards one of the sides. Then she'll go over to the opposite side and she'll pull it fairly taut before she staples that down. When we staple on top of the uh, decorative fabric, uh, it'll staple it down very securely indeed. So now she'll put more staples into the decorative fabric. All around the perimeter and then she'll come back and put a few more staples in because that's probably not quite enough. Really staples should be placed about one inch apart as she's doing here now. We highly recommend the Sayrite Short Nose Upholstery Staple Gun for applications like this. It's inexpensive and works exceptionally well. Now that the front decking is in place and the decorative fabric at the front is in place, we can start pushing the bottom decking fabric uh, in place at the seat area. In other words, underneath the arms and underneath the backrest and start feeding it through the frame so that we can pull it taut. We are not pulling the decorative fabric or the polyester batting uh, through at this time, only that underneath uh, decking piece. This uh, decking piece uh, protects uh, the polyester batting from being damaged by the springs, and it also gives a base for the decking. So we'll secure it in place first, pulling it through the left and right sides and also the back sides through the frame as it was when we tore the chair apart. So that's a good reason to take pictures before you tear everything apart to uh, make sure that you can remember how it was assembled. The frame of this Ethan Allen chair is built very, very well and uh, it's very tight to pull fabric through. There's not much room, uh, but that just provides for more stability for the frame. So Cindy will start to secure this decking piece at the rear, pulling it taut as she staples it in place. No reason to put staples too close. Uh, you want to make sure that you pull everything and it looks good uh, from inside the chair before you put too many staples in. You can always come back and put more staples in later. We'll also have the decorative fabric that will go over top of this and be stapled in place so it will secure it down as well. 
So she comes to the left side and the right side, pulls the fabric taut, and will staple it in place there as well. Here there's not as much fabric to pull on, but there's, there's enough. Now, once this bottom decking piece is in place, she can push the polyester batting in place at the seat. And then, after that's in place, she can pull the decorative fabric through uh, each one of these slits and staple it in place, just like she did with that uh, bottom decking piece. So here she's uh, positioning the uh, polyester batting, which is compressed, in place, on the seat, tucking it behind the foam so it lays nice and flat. No wrinkles here. When she disassembled the chair, she pulled this padding out uh, from underneath the uh, decking piece. So she remembers that she needs to put it in uh, to kind of bulk up the sides of this polyester batting. So she'll do that on the left side and the right side. Why is she doing this? Well, that's the way this chair was designed. Yours may not have those. I'm ready to pull the back towards the back and through the sides of the arms, but I'll need to make a cut right in this area to go around this part of the frame right here. Did she do something wrong? No, not at all. This is quite normal. You need to cut the decorative fabric so that you can pull it taut and anywhere that the decorative fabric runs into the corner of a frame or a frame board that prevents you from pulling it taut needs to have slits made. So did she cut it deep enough? Well, we won't be able to tell until everything is really tucked in place. She'll have to do the same thing here as well. She's cutting towards the corner. So basically uh, at a 45 degree towards the corner of the wood frame. Now she'll work on the left side, the right side, and the back side to pull the decorative fabric through. She has not yet stapled it in place, but she can tell that there's too much fabric here at the frame, which will not allow her to pull it tight. So she's going to cut a little bit deeper of a relief slit at that corner where it runs into the frame. Your goal here is to cut only deep enough so that that slit stops right at the frame. If you cut it too deep, the slit may go past where the frame rests, and then that slit may be visible. We don't really want it to be visible, though it's not a huge deal. Now Cindy is happy with the fit and she will start to staple the decorative fabric to the frame, pulling it as taut as possible as she does this. After it's secured with a few staples, she'll come back and staple it down with staples approximately one inch or so apart. But for now, basically three to five staples per side is enough to determine whether or not she likes the fit. If she doesn't, she could pull the staples and re-staple it. Now she moves to the rear. Don't worry about all that bulk fabric at this corner. You can just shove it in there. As she pulls on the decorative fabric here, or this fabric pull really, she's checking to make sure it looks good on the front before she staples it in place. Cindy is happy with how it looks, so she's going to put staples approximately every inch apart on all of these fabric poles. We will not show all of this. Be sure to pull it tight as you staple it. This chair had a thin uh, batting that was uh, fastened to the front and the sides uh, to kind of pad the uh, wood frame. Cindy is applying just a few staples to hold that in place. No need to apply a lot of staples here. And now the triangular shaped edge roll that was uh, removed from the upholstered piece can be reinstalled. We will install a few staples here to hold it in place at the appropriate location right along the edge as it was when we took it apart.
Again, no reason to install a ton of staples. The fabric will actually hold it in place fairly well as it comes down and over and is stapled to the frame. On the inside of the foam ridge, she will also staple about every six inches uh, on the uh, inner edge, as you can see here. When the chair was disassembled, on top of the foam edge roll was a uh, batting, a lofting batting. This is actually a cotton upholstery batting, though most cotton upholstery batting has been replaced with a polyester batting or a polyester loft. Uh, Sarah does sell it if you do not have enough of it or if uh, the stuff that was in your chair is damaged. Uh, you can uh, find it at the Sarah website. It's a similar uh, lofting material like this, but uh, obviously polyester with a little bit of a different uh, feel rather than this cotton. Some of the staples that were originally in the chair when we removed the old fabric were stuck to this lofting material, so Cindy's being careful to remove those staples that fall out of the lofting material so they don't accidentally get uh, felt by the occupant of the chair. So Cindy's making sure that it lays nice and flat. If it does not, and if it seems to have stretched a little bit, at one end you want to cut some of the excess off. You do not want to have any bumps in this uh, lofting. It should lay nice and flat because this is what people will feel. Cindy did not staple it to help hold it in place as the fabric is pulled over. You may want to do that. It may be helpful. Now the decorative fabric can be pulled over top of the uh, foam edge roll and this lofting material and start to be stapled in place. Cindy is uh, working the fabric into the corner of the chair so that corner falls right where it should. The foam on the front of the armrest is getting in the way and doesn't give us a clear shot of what we're doing, so Cindy will lift it up and staple it. She'll remove the staple later on. Now we can see what she's doing. That definitely helps. Some minor slits have to be made for the fabric to go around the frame of the chair. That is always done just by test fitting and then evaluating and then slitting. If something doesn't seem full, you can take some of that lofting material and stuff it in areas that uh, may be lacking some fullness. That is completely acceptable. Now to begin stapling this in place, we do not want to staple on the uh, surface that is visible, but along the bottom edge. Make sure the fabric is pulled taut as you staple it, but don't pull it so taut that it has uh, wrinkles in it. So you need to pull consistently as you staple around the bottom edge. If the lofting doesn't feel good underneath the uh, fabric, then you'll want to lift up the fabric and uh, smooth it out. Before Cindy staples this side down, she's checking to make sure that the uh, batting or the loft on the underside feels good and that it'll look good. If there are bumps, she'll uh, lift up the fabric and reposition it. So she's not going to staple it down until she's happy with the way it will eventually look.
you will notice that she is not putting a lot of staples in. She's basically fitting it and putting a few staples at a few general locations. If she doesn't like the way it looks, it's easy to remove a few staples rather than a lot. Once she's happy, she'll come back and staple the bejeebers out of it. And Cindy notices that some of the fabric at this corner is not allowing her to pull it tight, so she'll have to cut a little bit uh, of a deeper slit, or a new slit actually, so that the fabric can tuck around the frame and she can still tension it well. That's better. There's no need to put a lot of staples in right now. We're just putting preliminary staples in so we can get it positioned in the right spot. That way, if we're not happy with it, we can remove those staples and reinstall them. As she pulls on the fabric here, the fabric is running into the uh, horizontal frame. So she needs to cut a slit in the fabric so that she can pull the fabric nice and taut there and the fabric will not uh, run into that frame causing it to not be allowed to be tensioned. So she wants to cut slowly so she makes several cuts uh, testing to see if it's cut to the right depth. If it is, she can continue stapling. You may be asking, she's leaving a raw edge of fabric at the end. Well, that's not really the case. That will actually be covered by the outside arm in a later step. So that's why she doesn't create a fold here to make it look nice, because it will be covered later on. She just needs to pull it past the future cover. And now Cindy will just go around the perimeter and start stapling around the bottom edge, pulling everything tight as she goes. Once she's happy with the way it looks on top, she can flip the entire chair and start stapling around the perimeter. Be sure to install a staple at least one inch apart all around the perimeter, if not more. For your information, on upholstery jobs like this, we like to use 3 8 inch leg staples. And since this is an indoor furniture, we can use galvanized. Okay, I'm going to wait to attach that till I put the inside arm on. We'll now concentrate on covering the arms of the chair. Be sure your foam or uh, lofting is laying nice on the arm and then once you're satisfied you can start to fit your cover fabric over that arm. Then feed the fabric through the frame of the chair. This arm has a few fabric poles that have been secured to it, so Cindy is feeding them through the frame of the chair and checking to make sure the fit is good. Once the fabric's over the arm, she can now tell where uh, the fabric will run into the frame when she pulls it through the frame. So she'll have to cut a slit at this location so that she can pull the fabric taut around that arm. Remember, don't cut too deeply. She's cutting at a 45 degree angle towards that obstacle. Then she pulls the fabric through to check to see if that's enough. Looks like she needs to do a little bit more. Still too much uh, of a slack fabric here. So now that slit should be deep enough. She pushes the fabric into the frame and uh, so she can grab it from the side and pull it through. And then she checks for the fit. On the front arm at the top, it looks like it's a little lacking in some uh, uh, polyester fiber fill or uh, some uh, lofting material. So she puts a little bit of lofting material in there to fill it in. Uh, it had a little bit of a divot. And then she positions the fabric back over the arm again. 
That's not uncommon. Uh, if you notice that uh, there's some divots and so forth, you may need to with fill leather? areas with yeah. lofting or polyester fiber fill. She'll reposition the fabric and start pulling it through the frame again. This is probably the best angle to see what she's doing here to create a slit so the fabric can be pulled tightly against the frame. Okay, I'm gonna put one staple in so we have somewhere to start. <laughs> There is an outside arm piece that will be uh, secured at this location, so she's trying to keep her staple down far enough so that it is covered by that future piece. That looks pretty good. There is a little hollow spot right there at that notch. So Cindy's gonna have to probably put some polyester uh, fiber fill in there or some uh, polyester batting loft in there. There we go, we're gonna fill that cavity. Here's why you only want to put a few staples in. Cindy believes this can be tensioned better, so she's going to remove this staple and then uh, restaple it, pulling a little bit tighter on the fabric. That's why initially you don't want to put too many staples in. You want to uh, make sure it's in the right spot before you staple it down securely. Cindy's happy how the piping will come down and cover that. She's going to make sure the chair is pulled to the back and she'll start concentrating on stapling the fabric poles of that uh, arm cover from the back. So this is actually the fabric from the uh, side arm, not the decking. The next shot is from the underside of the okay. chair. This is where the uh, piping pulls through and uh, she secures it well to the chair. Now we'll follow that same procedure for the other arm. We will not show all of this since it's done in exactly the same manner. On the underside of the chair, she's looking for that piping piece. When she finds it, she'll pull it through and staple it to the underside of the chair, tensioning the front of the arm. Next, we'll concentrate on the decorative fabric for the backrest. 
check to make sure the foam and the uh, lofting is sitting nice and then position the fabric over the top. More slits will be made to accommodate the frame. Cindy is pushing the fabric poles through the frame of the chair so she can grab them from the back. The fabric pole also needs a slit to go around the uh, vertical section of that chair, the frame that is. Is that enough of a slit? And there's also too much fabric here, so Cindy will cut some of it away. We don't need all this excess here. That's part of the fabric pole. Looks like more than likely she's going to need to cut the slit a little bit deeper. So she pulls it out here and gives it a few more snips. Now hopefully it'll go around that uh, vertical section of the frame. In order to get the fabric pull to go around the frame, we need to cut a slit here as well. And also a slit up here to get past the vertical portion of the frame. After she creates the slit, she checks to see if it fits. If it does not, she'll need to cut it deeper. The first slit will work, but a second slit is required to go around the thickness of the frame. That's going to look good. So now everything looks like it's going to fit well, so she'll start stapling at the top of the chair, applying about four or five staples there to the middle section. Then she moves to the uh, bottom and applies a few staples there. We need to remember to put this little piece of elastic back in that hooks onto the cushion, so I'm going to tuck it down in between the deck and the inside arm and pull it out down here. and staple it back to the frame right here. This hook on elastic is used to help hold the cushion in place. Not many chairs have them. This uh, Ethan Allen chair does. That helps to hold the cushion in place when the occupant gets up and sits down in the chair. We'll attach the second one on the opposite side, doing the same thing. Here where the backrest runs into the arm of the chair, Cindy folds the fabric so it looks nice, because this will be visible here. So make sure it looks good before you start stapling it there. One staple is enough to check to see how it'll fit. If it fits well, then more staples will be applied. If not, then that staple will be removed and reapplied. It looks good, so she's going to continue to staple. As the fabric has to go around the curve here, the, there's going to have to be a few wrinkles because the fabric has to wrinkle as it takes a curve. So Cindy's going to show you exactly what she does here at the top of the chair to create a pleasing look.
when the seat back fabric is applied, it will hide all the staples. So do not put the staples too close to the uh, rolled edge. Uh, otherwise, they may be visible when the back panel is applied. Keep them in as, as deep as you possibly can. The inside back is now installed. We're ready for the next piece, which is the outside arm fabric. We've laid the chaise lounge on its side, and now we're attaching the uh, outside arm panel of fabric. We're positioning it so we have enough excess fabric at the bottom edge and the two sides. And then we flip it so outside surfaces are uh, down and staple it along this edge in about three locations. This is just to hold the fabric in place. Then we take our cardboard tack strip and we staple it with three to four staples as well and check to be sure that we're happy with the position of it because if we're not we can remove the staples and reposition it. So now we'll fold our fabric back and inspect the crease. The cardboard tack strip creates a beautiful crease there underneath the arm. Cindy's happy, so she will now uh, insert a staple about every inch or so apart along that cardboard tack strip. We'll lift up that fabric now after we've inspected to make sure it looks good, and we'll insert our polyester batting that we removed from the uh, chair when we disassembled it. We'll give it a few staples at a few general locations just to secure it in place. If you need more batting, Sayerite sells it. It's called a Polyester Batting White uh, .30 Loft, which is very similar to what is being used here. Cindy had to uh, rip up one staple and push the fabric down because she felt a lump there. That removes the lump. At the forward edge, we're going to use a metal tack strip, and we cut it with wire cutters. Just simply bend it until it breaks apart to the appropriate uh, height. Before we apply that, we want to staple it in the general position along the bottom edge with just a few staples. This keeps our fabric from moving as we install the metal tack strip. Now we fold our fabric over to that piping because that's where we want this metal tack strip to rest against. And then we push the prongs of the metal tack strip into the first layer of the fabric at that location. So the metal tack strip is directly beside the piping. So when it's folded under, it will be right alongside of it. Push the prongs through at the appropriate location. If it's uh, not in the right location, then you can reposition it again. Now fold the fabric under as Cindy is doing here. There's a little bit of bulk fabric at the top that she will cut away. It'll be hard to fold it there since there's so much fabric, so she removes that. Now she can fold it under and tuck that top edge so it creates a nice fold there. You may need to use something to get the fabric to lay nice. And once it's uh, in position, right next to that piping, that's our goal, we can use a, an upholstery mallet or a hammer and start pounding the prongs into the frame of the uh, chair. And this gives it a beautiful finished edge. Cindy's going to pry it up here and she's going to try to push her piping into that uh, area a little bit so that it grabs the flange of the piping. It missed it there. So she pushes her piping up into that prong and it grabs the piping. Nicely done. With that forward edge secured, now all she has to do is staple along the back and the bottom edge to secure this side panel in place. We're going to show this in double time. There is a location where the uh, foot has to be screwed in, so Cindy will take some scissors here and cut out the fabric so that that hole, threaded hole, is exposed. I'm cutting that away because that's where the leg gets screwed in. We will repeat that for the other side. We will not show this, since the process is the same. 
Securing the back panel fabric is next. The excess fabric at the back of the chair can either be cut off or pushed into the frame of the chair, just as long as you can't feel it or is visible. That's all that matters. Before the decorative fabric goes on, there was a uh, fabric that was used as an inside lining that uh, we removed from the uh, chair we disassembled, which is this exact same chair, and we're going to staple it around the perimeter. When she gets to the bottom edge here, the fabric is not resting flat up against the frame because there's some shape there. So she cuts some slits in the fabric so it's allowed to rest and be flat up against the frame. No need to staple this to death because the uh, decorative fabric will be stapled right on top of this. That will apply more staples later. She's only uh, positioning it rather tautly on the back of our chaise lounge. Now we'll take some of that piping that we made and we will secure it along the outer edge of the back of the chair, folding it under the bottom edge by about an inch or two. We'll make sure that the piping is a consistent uh, depth inside the edge of the chair all along the back here. We want it to cover up all those staples that are on the inside that secured all the fabric on. We also want it to look good, so we're just positioning it all around the perimeter and stapling it in place along the flange of the piping. Since this piping is a bias piping, it takes curves like this easily. Do this around the entire perimeter. We're going to move on and uh, show you the next step. Now we'll staple the decorative fabric in a few spots at the bottom edge first. I may need to come back and adjust these, but it holds it in place while I work on the sides and the top. The two sides are perfectly straight, so there we can use a metal tack strip uh, about three quarters of the way up. So she's going to cut it to size with the wire cutters yet again. The curve at the top edge and uh, the top will have a flexible tack strip installed because these uh, metal tack strips do not take curves well. First she's going to put a single staple at the top here to make sure the fabric doesn't move around on her. Now we can install the metal tack strips just like we showed earlier. The fabric's been folded right to the edge of the piping and the metal tack strip is pushed through the fold of the fabric. All the prongs are inserted into the fabric so the fabric stays nice and taut in the uh, metal tack strip. And then the fabric is folded the opposite direction to create a nice straight edge and that edge can be tacked into the frame of the chair right next to that piping to give it a really nice finished look. Now if you look closely here you can see it's not very tight, the fabric is not. Don't worry about that, we haven't uh, tensioned it on the other side and it's not really been tensioned much on the bottom either. We're just securing this edge. When we go to the other side, we'll be able to pull the fabric taut. Okay. Cindy cuts another metal tack strip to the same size and we'll apply it on the opposite side in the same manner. We're going to show this in double time. Cindy wasn't quite happy with the position, so she will pull the prongs out and reposition it one more time. It does not damage the fabric much, especially since the uh, part that has the prongs in it will be folded under. So don't worry about it if you have to reposition it. As long as you get it close, it doesn't, doesn't hurt the fabric at all. So she wants to be able to tension it fairly tight here. That's quite all right. You don't want it to be... Uh, sloppy here so she's going to have to pull on it fairly hard against the other side and then she'll start tacking it in place so the fabric's nice and tight.
let's go ahead and move on. This is definitely going to go on very well. Now we'll pull that single staple that we placed in the middle of the top just to hold the fabric in place out. Fold the fabric back and we'll secure the flexible metal tack strip. This tack strip allows us to take a gentle curve like we have at the top of our chaise lounge. The flexible metal tack strip has prongs and in each prong there's a hole. Your task is to get the stapler to staple one leg in the hole and one leg off of the prong so that it staples uh, securely uh, to the frame. The other task is to get the end of the prongs, that flat end, up against the structure where you want the fabric to rest, and we want it to rest right up against the piping. So we want the uh, end of the prong to be right next to the piping because that's where the fabric will fold to create a beautiful fold. And if you've never done this before, it does take a, a little bit of practice, probably two or three uh, times to figure out where each one of the legs will staple into the hole of the prong. So notice the prongs are right up against the uh, piping. That's where we want it placed. You can cut it easily. I shouldn't say easily. It takes a little bit of finagling with wire cutters to the right size. Obviously the uh, flexible metal tack strip will stop just shy of the metal tack strip that we installed on the left and right side. Now the fabric will uh, not fold like this so she's going to actually cut into the uh, fabric to allow it to rest or to go into the flexible metal tack strip. She doesn't want to cut all the way to that fold but very close to it and that way the fabric can be splayed out. So there she's probably about an eighth inch away from the fold. So the fabric can be tucked into the teeth of uh, the uh, flexible metal tack strip. She did that on the other side as well. Then starting from the top center, Cindy will grip or pinch the fabric and the teeth on the metal tack strip will grab it. Now there's way too much fabric in here, so Cindy becomes aware of that and she starts to cut some of the excess fabric out. We want the edge where she's cutting to be tucked underneath the metal tack strip and uh, basically away from the piping so it's not visible when that fold that the uh, prongs have grabbed is pushed towards the piping. So make sure that you cut enough away that there's no excess fabric sticking out. This cut will be better. It leaves enough fabric for the prongs to grab, but not so much that it sticks out when the prongs are bent into position. Here's a little tip. If you have problems with the fabric uh, being grabbed by those sharp prongs, bend them down slightly. This will allow for the fabric to be more easily gripped by the prongs. Cindy's going to cut the excess fabric away, basically running her scissors along the outer edge of the piping should provide enough fabric uh, for the flexible metal tack strip to grab. Now, because the prongs are bent slightly, the teeth on them grip the fabric better than if they'd not been bent back. She's having to make a few modifications here so that the uh, fold here between the straight tack strip and the flexible tack strip transition smoothly. Once the fabric is tucked underneath and the prongs grab it well, she'll use her upholstery mallet and then start to bend or tap on the prongs until they're flat. As you can see, this gives a beautiful finished look to the chair. Nice, right up against the piping. Exactly what we want. We'll do that around the entire perimeter. We will not show more of this. A 
our fabric is nice and taut everywhere. So along the bottom edge, the chair is upside down. We'll start to staple the remainder of the fabric in place with several staples. To cover the bottom side, we'll apply a cambric dust cover. That's next. In most upholstery applications, a cambric dust cover is stapled to the underside of the upholstered furniture. We're reusing the cambric dust cover that we removed from the chair, uh, but Sayerite sells it if you need new uh, fabric. We like to fold the edge under one hem and staple it in place all around the perimeter. If the holes for the uh, feet do not line up, you'll need to create new holes so that you know exactly where each one of the feet uh, screw into uh, the frame. No big deal uh, cutting new holes. Even though there is a hole there for the old foot, this one doesn't match up so we have to cut a new hole. We will not show this. This process is fairly easy. We just staple around the entire perimeter until it's done. After this is done, we'll screw our feet back into position. The optional skirt is next. We're going to show you how to make it and staple it in place. Adding the skirt is next, but you may not want to add it. If you like the way the chair looks, which I like a lot without the skirt, you may just want to stop here. But if you prefer the skirt, which was on the old chair, here's what it looks like with the skirt. It's your choice. Installing the skirt is next. We're ready to cut all these little um, flaps that go under the skirt pieces. So I'm going to need eight of them. And they're all the same. So I can cut these all at once. You can see that there's a little bit tucked under here that I need to account for when I measure the um, height of this. So I'm going to start my tape measure back here and come around to the front. So I need to cut 10 inch pieces by about seven is fine. So 10 tall and seven wide and I need eight of them. In this uh, lining on the back, we're going to replace. We're not going to reuse this and we're just going to use drapery lining for this. This is obviously steps to create the skirt that goes around the bottom of the chaise lounge. If you don't want a skirt, or some people think it looks better without a skirt, you would obviously skip this chapter. On these pieces, I'm gonna put an X at the top of each one, so I know which is the top and the bottom. Um, in case there's any shading difference in, the, in one side of this to the other, so I don't get it upside down. I didn't do that on the other pieces because I could easily tell which was the top and the bottom of the piece. These were cut from the fabric, so the weave is going up. This is one of the skirt pieces that you'll see on the outside, and I'm gonna measure it just like I did on the smaller piece from the bottom, the underside up and around to the front. This one's also about 10, but I'm gonna give myself, I think 11 inches, um, just so that I have a little play in these skirt pieces. So this one needs to be 11. by 17 and I have two like that. So I'm gonna cut two 11 by 17 pieces for these two. These are all the skirt pieces that I need to go around my chair. Three are the same length, two of these are the same length and then there's one that's longer and these two shorter ones that I've already cut. Same process to cut all of them. This is a skirt piece and this uh, skirt lining that's inside here, we're going to reuse that. So I'm just going to cut this open and slide this out. And I'll mark it the same. This is a side back, so I'll put side back on this inside piece also. We'll be reusing the stiffener on the inside of these pieces, though we will make new skirts out of our new decorative fabric. Though the old chair had a skirt on it, it is optional. You may prefer not to install skirts around the perimeter. We're going to make the skirt pieces for our chair, and I'm using drapery lining to replace this fabric that's on the back of these. So I'm going to put my pieces right sides together with my X mark at the top, and just put a couple pins across the bottom. This is where I'm going to stitch, just across the bottom first. And I cut this fabric, the drapery lining, the same size as my 
skirt piece. We have many skirt pieces, so we'll continue to do this for all of the pieces that we have, making a lining the same size as the decorative piece. Outside surfaces are facing each other, not that there's an outside surface to the lining piece, only the decorative piece for us. I'm going to stitch along the bottom of all of these pieces at about 3 8 There is no reason to do any reversing here to lock your stitch in place since we'll be creating a hem on the long edges, or the vertical edges I should say. Here we are just sewing the bottom edge of each one of these panels. We will not show all of this since there are several skirt pieces. Then I'm going to fold the lining up so that there is about three-eighths to half an inch of the fabric on the back side of this piece. And I'll do that with all of them and sew up the sides. At that bottom edge, we did a little bit of reversing there, but no reason to do it at the top edge. We're only sewing the sides at this point. We'll do this with all the skirt pieces. We will not show all of this. Then I need to turn all the pieces right side out. To turn them right side out, you'll need to insert your fingers into the corner and push them out well. If you can't do it with your fingers, do it with a tool that is sharp enough to push the corners out but not damage the fabric. Here, Cindy is using the sewing gauge ruler, six inch, that's available from Sailrite to push those corners out. Cindy will use the Sailrite canvas patterning ruler in an attempt to press or crease the fabric so it lays nicely. If I were doing this, I would use an iron to press the fabric. You'll find the end result is much nicer for the skirts after they are stapled to our chaise lounge. We'll do this with all the skirt pieces. We will not show that. Now I can put these um, pieces that make the skirt have some body, I can put them back in. And all I need to do is kind of center that, push it down towards the bottom so that it ends up down here in the crease. And I like to staple them in so they stay in place. I'm only stapling it to the lining, not to the front piece. The lining will be facing towards the inside of the chair, so no one should see it. Now she ensures that everything is laying nice and flat, and then she will pin the decorative fabric to the lining fabric at the top edge. She will eventually be sewing across this top edge, but uh, first we need to take it to the chair and determine where we're going to sew. And that's after the piping is installed around the perimeter of the chair. Follow this same procedure for all the skirt pieces and the stiffeners that go in them. When I took my skirt off, of the original chair, I measured how far up the cording was on the frame of the chair, and that measurement was six and a quarter. So to put the skirt back on, I'm going to measure up six and a quarter and mark, and that's where the stitching on the cording will go when I put it back on here. And I'll make this mark all the way around the outside of the chair, and then apply my cording. I'm going to apply the cording with the stitching at my yellow mark and I want it to start in the back so I'm going to leave this extra to go around the back and just put a few staples in all the way around.
to join the piping, what we want to do is we want to take off the fabric cover by removing some of the stitches. Then we will cut the uh, cording so that it's even with the end of the cording that's covered by the fabric. We'll cut off some of the excess and then fold the end so it creates a 45 degree uh, angle so it looks nice. And we will tuck the uh, cording end inside of that uh, flange and staple it in place. This is at the uh, center back of the chair. Right, to give myself a straight line to apply my skirt to the cording, I'm going to mark up nine inches on the skirt. And then I'm going to stitch on that line. And that will give me a guideline to apply it to the chair. And I will do that to all of the skirt pieces. This nine inches basically uh, leaves the skirt off the floor by about a half inch or so. She will do this to all the skirt pieces. After it's sewn, she'll remove the pins. No need to do any reversing. This is just a guide and also a fold line. Okay, I've measured from this seam to the seam on the other side to find the center front of my furniture. And we've made a mark right here on the cording. And I've marked this as the front piece. So I'm gonna measure or fold this in half and mark the center of this so that I can apply it to the front of the, sofa, front of the chair and then I'll work my way around with the other pieces. This skirt will fold down, so right now it's upside down, and Cindy is placing that stitch line right along the stitch line of the piping. And she centers it. And I'm going to lay my stitching line that I have on the skirt piece on the stitching of the cording, and before I go too far, I'll flip it over and make sure that the length is okay. At the ends of each skirt, it is folded back, folded back to where? Where the stiffener was installed. So the fabric folds uh, along the edge of the stiffener that was placed inside the skirt. We'll do that for each one of the pieces. Cindy inspects it, and if she likes it, she'll continue to install more staples in the cardboard tack strip. Okay, at this point you can um, turn it over and stand it up and check the length. Um, I'm pretty confident with my stitching, so I think we're okay. And you can see that the foot of the chair is below my skirt, so it's not going to drag on the floor. A good technique is to actually staple it in place where the cardboard tack strip will eventually be run. So you don't have to worry about the panel moving. All you have to do now is just lay cardboard tack strip on top of it and staple it down securely. So she's going to continue to place each one of these skirts at the appropriate position. Remember that we marked the skirt uh, pieces so we know exactly where they rested on the chaise lounge before. Before I staple all this down, I'm just checking my pieces and make sure I have them in the right places and that everything's going to fit where it's supposed to. These little panels that we made need to be inserted underneath the pleat area. And those need to be made a little bit shorter than your skirt is so that when it flips over, it doesn't hang out from the bottom. Very nice. We'll continue to do this all around the perimeter of the chair.
At this point, there are definitely not enough staples in the cardboard tack strip. After everything is in position, Cindy will come back and apply more staples. Basically, staples should be placed about every inch or so. Okay, mm -hmm. you good? If you want to clean this up a little bit, you can trim some of this fabric away after you have your skirt in place. Sometimes these skirt panels want to flip up a little bit. To help that these stay in place, you can put a pin, pin it to the piece behind it, and just leave it like this for a couple of days. Or you can take masking tape and tape it all the way around the the base of the chair to hold these in place for a couple of days and then they'll stay. Regarding how to make the cushions, we have two tutorial videos showing how to make the seat cushion and another video showing how to make the backrest cushion. The concepts for both are very similar. If you would like to see those videos, click the links in the description. Don't go away, the materials list and the tools list is coming up next. It is only through your loyal support that these free videos are made available. Thanks for your loyal support. And be sure to subscribe to the Sarat YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. Thanks. You can find thousands of home decor fabrics that work great for upholstery jobs like this. We used Krypton home fabric available from Sailrite. Almost all the tools and the materials to reupholster a chair like this are covered in this list. If you have questions about any of the materials or the tools that we used in this video, be sure to give us a call or email us at Sailrite. We are glad to help. These are some related videos that may be of interest to you. Click on them to view them. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sailrite, thanks for watching.